Let everybody say amen. amen. Good afternoon, my friends. Oh, I'm happy to see you. Aren't you happy to see me? Good afternoon, my friends. Turn to the person on your right hand, your left. They don't have a smile. Give them yours. Tell them it's not right for the upright to be uptight. It's not right for the upright to be uptight. I'm excited and delighted to be here to make my annual pilgrimage to one of the greatest churches in the North American division, pastored by one of the greatest pastors in the North American division. And I'm here today not by merit, but through friendship with your pastor. His life, his ministry, his witness has been a nurturing and sustaining force in my own life and ministry, and you are highly favored of God to have Dr. Jews as your pastor. Uh, you ought to love him, you ought to appreciate him, you ought to thank God, you ought to follow him, and he will lead you from one degree of growth and grace and development to another. I'm happy today to have in the audience my sister-in-law, Sister Arlene. I want you to stand and just give a wave. And um, my nephew, uh, Jordan, is also here. I don't know where he's sitting, but I want him to just to stand and to give a wave. Now, this afternoon, the seminar is entitled, Winning the Winner Bluff. How this church can reach this community. And to set context for my seminar this afternoon, I want to take a, a poll. How many of you in this building Looking at me right now, how many of you, how many of you, how many of you were born in this community, were not a Seventh-day Adventist, and somebody from this church came into this community and brought you out of darkness into this marvelous light. How many of you in this building this morning fit that category? If you do, I want you to stand to your feet. How many of you? There is not a single one. And that's an awful indictment upon our churches because they are not reaching our communities. And this afternoon, the seminar will teach you how this church might reach this community. If you have your Bibles, let me hear you say amen. amen. If you don't have your Bibles, let me hear you say, oh me. Will the amens please share with the oh me's? Our spotlight today is on the book of Romans, the 13th chapter. The 11th 
through the 14th verses. If you have your Bibles, open them up. And that knowing the time, that now it is what, everybody? High time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on who everybody? The Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Would you bow your heads with me for just a moment, please? Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, as we open your sacred word today, stand in this body, think with this mind, speak through these lips, guide us to the blessed feet of Jesus, and feed us Till we want no more. For we pray that we ask it all in the strong and perfect name. And let all the people say, Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gave birth to today's message through an article that I read by. Vivian Bounty, that is entitled, What's Up With Up? And I quote, she says, it is easy to understand why people learning English have such trouble with the language. For there is no two-letter word that has more meanings than the word up. She says, it's easy to understand up, meaning towards the sky. But when we awaken in the morning, why do we have to wake up? At a meeting, why does a topic come up? Why do we speak up? And why are officers up for election? And why is it up to the secretary to write up a report? We call up friends and brighten up a room. We polish up the silver and warm up the leftovers. We clean up the kitchen. We lock up the house. And some guys even fix up the car. Sometimes the word up 
has special meaning. People stir up trouble, line up for tickets, work up an appetite, and think up excuses. To be dressed is one thing. But to be dressed up is special. Then there is the conflicting use of the word up. A drain must be opened up because it is stopped up. We open up a store in the morning, but we close it up at night. When it threatens to rain, we say it is clouding up. When the sun comes out, we say it is clearing up. No wonder we are so mixed up. <laughs> About up. And then she says, I can go on and on and on and on about up. But I will wrap it up for my time is up. And before I mess it up and screw it up, I will just shut up. It dawned upon me that even sacred writers, hymnologists, Use the word up to get their message across. I'm pressing on the... Are you all going to help me? I'm pressing on the up one way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Lord, lift me up. And I shall stand by faith on heaven's table land. Jesus is on the main line. Call him up and tell him what you want. My faith looks up to thee. Sign me up for the Christian Jubilee. Fill my cup, Lord. Fill it up, Lord. And I may go on. Ad infinitum. I am going up a yonder. To be like my Lord. Stand up. Stand up. For Jesus. Up. From the grave he arose. As a mighty conqueror. Over his foes. Even. Commercial advertisers. Use the word up to get their message across. So there is the sweeten up ad of the sugar industry and the cover up ad of the carpet industry and the moving up ad of the trucking industry 
and the brighten up air of the detergent industry. And the up, 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 and away ad of the airline industry. But the most classic one of them all is this. It's the seven up ad. of the beverage industry. How many of you have ever drunk a 7-Up? Let me see your hands. Shame <laughs> on you. This stuff has nothing in it but water, tons and tons of granulated sugar, artificial flavoring, and carbon dioxide to make it fizz. That's it. And yet, the Food and Drug Administration declares that the average American family imbibes over 150 bottles of this death-dealing liquid every year, making us vulnerable to all kinds of diseases, from cancer, to heart attacks, to hypertension, to diabetes, you name it. But even as there is a commercial bottle of 7-Up, God has placed in his word a spiritual bottle of 7-Up. So that every one of you looking at me right now who is hungering and thirsting after righteousness can drink from God's spiritual bottle of 7-Up and receive the spiritual vim, vigor, and vitality that you need to make it on your pilgrimage towards the promised land. How many of you out there are hungering and thirsting after righteousness? Let me see your hands. Well, are you ready for some seven up? Huh? Are you ready to drink from God's bottle? Of seven up. Are you ready? I mean, like pen and paper. Ready. Are you ready? Well, the first up, number one, it is time to wake up. Everybody say, Wake up. What time is it? I don't mean according to your watch. According to God's alarm clock. Our text this morning tells us it is time to wake up. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to do what everybody, wake up, time to wake up. It is said of Napoleon Bonaparte that he was looking 
at a map of the entire world. And he took his finger and he placed it and pressed it upon China and declared, here lies a sleeping giant. Let her sleep. If she ever wakes up, she is going to shake this world. And how the devil must say that about God's church today. Here lies a sleeping giant. Let her sleep. If she ever wakes up, she is going to shake this city. The church today is chloroformed by the spirit of the age. So many members like Samson, are asleep in the lap of Delilah. We are a church of slumbering saints and sleeping sinners, and it's high time to wake up. But then, church, it is time, it is time, it is time, it is time to not just wake up. Time to get up. Everybody say, get up. Get up. When you wake up in the morning, what is the next thing that you do? You get up. And some of us, are awakened, but that's all. And I have discovered that as pastors, we know how to wake folks up. My boyhood pastor did not allow anybody to go to sleep in church while he was preaching. And he would wake folks up, call you out by name, wake you up. He was up preaching one day, and this young fellow went to sleep during the sermon. I mean, he was sleeping so hard, you could have taken out his appendix, and he wouldn't even know it. And the pastor stopped preaching, put aside his notes, and he said to the deacon, wake that brother up for me. Nobody goes to sleep in this church while I'm preaching. And the deacon looked at the pastor and he says, oh no, pastor, he says, you put him to sleep? You wake him up. And as preachers, we know how to wake folks up. But not everybody that wakes up gets up. Can I get a witness here? Don't you all have one of these alarm clocks with a snooze button on it? that you can just press and it allows you to sleep a little while longer. And some of you all do that to Pastor Jew. You get up for a split second and yawn in his face and you go right back to sleep. And what Paul is saying to every one of you looking at me right now is don't just wake up and yawn in the face of God. Press the snooze button and go back to sleep. It is time to get up 
Why? Because the night is prospering. Meaning, the hour is late. And the day is at hand. It is later than you think. It is later in this age than you may think. God's alarm clock is going off all around us in Ebola, in the ISIS crisis, in same-sex marriages that are sweeping like a tidal wave across this country, in gun violence that's mowing down young people in schools across this nation, in the buffoonery of Donald Trump, in maniacs like Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un, who threatened to destroy this world with nuclear annihilation. The world today is torn by strife and division. It is loud with cursing. It's soggy with blood. It's venereal with sin. How could anyone stand with an open Bible in one hand and the New York Times in another hand and read and not realize that we are living in the toenails of time? The trumpet is about to sound. And Jesus is about to come. And it is later in this age than you may think. And then it is later in the church than you think. I just got through reading a book entitled The Last Years of the Church. And the author declares that the church today no longer exists in the time of the end. It's now in the end of time. You say, well, what is the difference between the time of the end and the end of time? When I was a little boy growing up in Trinidad, my mother had as a Christmas tradition, stuffing turkeys for Christmas dinner. But she would buy her turkey round about Thanksgiving and start fattening it up for Christmas morning. Now, the moment that turkey was bought, that begun the time of the end. But on Christmas morning, when she raised the knife to cut off the neck, that was the end of time. So the time of the end is that little period just before the end of time. And the church today no longer exists in the time of the end. It's now in the end of time. And how could you sleep comfortably in the pew with the sands of time running out and prophecy being fulfilled all around us and not realize it is later in the church than you think. And then it is later in your life than you may think. I was speaking with one lady a few days ago. And she said to me, I said to her, my sister, how are you doing? And she said, Brother Pastor, you don't really want to know. 
She says, I have been so sick, I was close to death. I said to the contrary, you were not close to death because you did not die. You are actually closer to death today than you have ever been. Now, I know that most of you think that you are going to live to be a hundred years of age and curl up in your pajamas and die a serene and a peaceful death in your bed at home. But more people die in street clothes than die with their pajamas on. And so David says, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. And when you number your days, you discover that the days of a man's life are three score years and ten. Meaning that if you were to live the promised time, you have 28,200 days to live. That's it. And what is that? If you are now 40 and you live to be 80, you have 14,600 days left. And what is that? I am now 70. If I should live to be 80, I have 3,650 days left. And what is that? But the tragic truth of the matter is that David said, that even though you are in perfect health right now, there is but one step between you and death. 40,000 Americans will get into their automobiles this year. 110 people this very day not dreaming that this is the last step that they will ever take. In this world in which we live, 55 million people die every year. 151,000 every day. 6,000 every hour. 100 every minute. With every tick of the clock. People like you and people like me and one of those ticks may be yours and one of those ticks may be mine. And it may be later in your life than you may think. And given the shortness of time and the vastness of eternity, Life is too short. Eternity is too long. Your soul is too precious to be just messing around. For it is later in your life than you may think. And how could you sit comfortable in that pew Knowing that it's later in this age, later in the church, and later in your life than you may think. It is high time to get up. But then, church, it is time, it is time, it is time, it is time to not just get up. Time to clean up. Everybody say, clean up. When you get up in the morning, 
What is the next thing that you do? You clean up. So the verse continues. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Take off your night clothes. Clean up and put on the armor of light. Now the picture here is that of a young man who is out all night long on the town engaging in rioting and drunkenness, chambering and wantonness. And he comes home in the wee hours of the morning with his dirty, filthy garments on, reeking and smelling with the stain and spot of sin. Doesn't even undress. Just falls down in the bed in a drunken stupor and goes to sleep. Then gets up the next morning and continues to walk in the light of a brand new day with the same dirty, filthy, sin-stained garments of the night before. And Paul says, man, you have got to clean up. You can't walk in the light of a brand new day in the same dirty, sin-stained garments of the night before. And ladies and gentlemen, the Bible declares that the part of the just is like a shining light. That shineth more and more unto the perfect day. And as you walk in the light of God's truth, if you want God to bless and favor your life, you have got to clean your life up. Remove every spot, every sin, Every stain, every blood, every blemish, every blur. Write the scripture down. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 18. The Bible says, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. Sin is ugly. Sin is deadly. Sin is destructive. Sin is disgusting. Sin has the hand of God against it. And it separates you from God's peace and God's promise and God's power and God's purpose and God's provision. I don't believe that many of us realize how much of the heartache and heartbreak and pain and suffering and failure and misery and bad luck and disappointment and misfortune is the result of this favor of God upon our lives. Some of you will never have your prayers answered. Will never rise above your present circumstances. Will never see your hopes and dreams come through. Because you can't have the favor of God until there is freedom from your sin. So cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. It is time to 
time to, time to clean up. But then, church, it is time, it is time, it is time, it is time, it is time to not just clean up, time to dress up. Everybody say, dress up. Now, somebody, somebody, somebody is going to baker at you and commit you to a mental institution. If some glad morning you were to wake up, get up, clean up, lay aside your bed clothes, Brush your teeth, wash your face, shave, shampoo your hair, took a shower, put on your blusher and your foundation and your eyeshadow and your makeup, spread Eau de Cologne, John Vevillere, Evening in Paris, Chanel number no. five, all over your body. And then run out of the house without any clothes on. They will baker at you and put you into a mental institution thinking that you are crazy. And this is what Paul is saying. It's not enough just to wake up. It's not enough just to get up. It's not enough just to clean up you have got to dress up, put on whom everybody, the Lord Jesus Christ. That word put on means to clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't, don't run out of the house to face the challenges of a brand new day as a spiritual nudist. God has designed a spiritual wardrobe for every one of his children. Write the scripture down. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. Know each garment that's in your spiritual wardrobe. He says, put on, clothe yourself. I mean, every morning, early in the morning, in your private devotion, clothe yourself with the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth and the shoes of peace and the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit which taken all together represents the robe of Christ's righteousness. And when you are all dressed up in Jesus and God looks down at you, guess what he sees? He sees Jesus 
And you are complete in him. Everything, everything, everything that you need to make yourself holy is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can face each day with confidence because Jesus is before you and Jesus is behind you and Jesus is within you and Jesus is all around you. And nothing, 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 nothing can get to you except that which Jesus allowed. Because you are all dressed up in Jesus. And notice he says to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. A whole lot of folk are all dressed up but they leave their backs out and their arms out and their buttocks out and their thighs out and their belly buttons out and their breasts are all hanging out. You better watch out that making provision for the flesh. You are a single young person with a sex addiction. And you are on the birth control pill or walking around with a condom in your back pocket. That's making provision for the flesh. You are an alcoholic. and You've got a refrigerator filled with coals and Michelob and vodka and rum that's making provision for the flesh. You are overweight and you've got a pantry that is piled high with nothing but junk food. That's making provision for the flesh. Like the father that came home one day to find his little girl swimming in the pool. And he said to her, honey, I thought I instructed you not to go swimming when I am not here for safety reasons. She said, oh, daddy, I am so very sorry. I really didn't mean to do it. Father said, well, if you really didn't mean to do it, how come you are all dressed up? In that bathing suit, that, she said, oh, I just put it on, just in case I happen to be tempted. That's making provision for the flesh. When you are all dressed up in Jesus, and make no provision for the flesh. You are complete in him. And whatever happens, if death should overtake you, or Jesus should come, you will be able to exclaim like Edward Moe, when he shall come, with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be 
found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne I am all dressed up in Jesus. And it's high time for you to be dressed up. But then, church, it is time, it is time, it is time, it is time, it is time to not just dress up, time to step up. Everybody say, step up. Back up to the 13th verse. He says, let us walk honestly as in the day. The New American Standard Version says, let us walk responsibly as in the day. Now that you're all dressed up, you are ready to step up and meet your responsibilities for the day. But a whole lot of folk come to church all dressed up, but they never step up and bear the load of responsible membership. You're like the lady who was standing by the roadside one day, stranded, helplessly looking at her automobile that had suffered a flat tire. Kindly gentleman got out and fixed the flat tire. And as he was letting down the jack, she thanked him. And she said, please, sir, let the jack down easily, gently so as not to disturb my husband who is asleep on the back seat. We ought never to go to sleep while others do our work. We ought not to shift our load onto somebody else's shoulder. We ought not to sit and soak in silence in your seat while others make all of the sacrifices so that you can sit back in a comfortable pew. Just got through reading a book entitled The Comfortable Pew which the order declares that the problem in the church today is that we have become far too comfortable. We get up on Sabbath morning at a comfortable hour, out of a comfortable bed, in a comfortable home, we get into a comfortable car and we take a comfortable ride to a comfortable church. We choose a comfortable pew and we sit down next to the people with whom we feel the most comfortable. We ask the conference to send us a preacher that we are comfortable with so he can preach us comfortable sermons.
turn us loose at a comfortable hour so that we can get back out of that comfortable pew back into that comfortable car take a comfortable ride back to a comfortable home and sit down and have Sabbath dinner with the people with whom we feel most comfortable. And then we get back right where we started in that comfortable bed for some lay activity. And the church is languishing because of members who refuse to step up. But then, church, it is time. It is time, it is time, it is time to not just step up. It is time to Fill up. Everybody say, fill up. Now that you stepped up and you're ready to meet the responsibilities of the day, how are you energized? You sit down at the breakfast table and you fill up, fill up with what? Write the scripture down. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with what everybody? The Holy Spirit. To be energized and equipped and empowered for service. It's imperative that you be filled with the Holy Spirit. So many of us, so many of us, so many of us possess the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit does not possess us. I didn't ask, is he resident? I want to know, is he president? I didn't ask, is he present? I want to know, is he preeminent? I didn't ask, is he dormant? I want to know, is he dominant? I didn't ask, is he there in content? I want to know, is he there in control? For the Holy Spirit wants to do a threefold work in your life right now. He wants to do something for you. That's salvation. So the Bible says, don't resist him. He wants to do something in you. That's sanctification. So the Bible says, don't grieve him. And he wants to do something through you. That's service. So the Bible says, don't quench him. And I'm asking you today to yield your life to the full, complete, absolute, unconditional surrender of your life to the Holy Spirit. And say, Holy Spirit, Fill me 
and use me in your service. I'm ready now to be filled up. But then, church, it is time, it is time, it is time, it is time to not just fill up, time to reach up. Everybody say, reach up. Now, this church, this church, this church has been a great church. But God told me to tell you that it's time now to reach up to something higher. And Ellen White declares, higher than the highest human thoughts can reach is God's ideal for his children. Godliness, God-likeness is the goal to be reached. Well, how do you reach the goal? Write the scripture down. Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. The Bible says, Forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forth to those things which are before. Forgetting those things which are behind. That's the past. And pressing forth to those things which are before. That's the future. Forgetting those things which are behind. No man, no man, no man ever won a race looking back over his shoulder. If you look back, you are in trouble. Lot's wife looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. A little boy in Sabbath school said, I could identify with that my mama was driving the family car and she looked back and it turned into a telephone pole. If you look back, you are in trouble. You lose your rhythm and your, and your stride, your focus, your balance, your momentum. If you look back, you are in trouble forgetting those things which are behind. Well, what is behind? Past guilt and past grief and past grudges and past goals and past glory. Forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forth to those things which are ahead. Well, Brother Organist, what is ahead? The prize is ahead. The finish line is ahead. The goal is ahead. And with every inch, 
with every ounce, with every nerve, with every fiber, with every sinew, with every corpuscle, with every breath that is in my body, I am pressing on to the mark of the high calling of God that is found in Christ Jesus. Singing with that hymnology. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward down. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Well, why do you want to climb so high, brother pastor? Because my heart has no desire to stay. Where doubts arise and fears this may, though some may dwell where these are found, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. I'm going up and 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 up. And it's not because I want to be like the star, but because I want to live above this world though Satan's darts at me are heard for faith has heard the joyful sound it's the sound of saints on a higher ground so I'm going to wake up and then I'm going to get up. And then I'm going to dress up. And then I'm going to clean up. And then I'm going to step up. And then I'm going to fill up and go up and up and up and up and up and up until I've scaled the utmost and caught a gleam of glory bright and still I'll pray till heaven I've found Lord Lord, Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Somewhere, somewhere, somewhere. A long time ago, I read about a grave that is located at the foot of the Alps. And in that grave lies buried the body of a famous mountain climber who plunged 
to his death while trying to climb the highest peak of the Alpine mountains. This man, this man, this man, this man loved mountain climbing so much that when he died they decided to bury him at the foot of the mountain from which he fell. And on his grave they placed a tombstone. And on that tombstone, they place an epitaph. And on that epitaph, they wrote an inscription. And for that inscription, they wrote three words. He died climbing. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to shut up or back up or let up or give up until the very day that I am taken up because I want to die climbing. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed as we pray. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the love of God that fills our hearts. For the power of God to rise above our weaknesses. For the grace of God that has appeared unto all men and for the spirit of God that has been with us as we have tried to declare your word today. Fill our hearts with your love, our lives with your spirit. Let the word of God be especially precious to us today so that we might wake up and then get up and then clean up and then dress up and then step up and then fill up and then reach up to a higher platform of Christian existence. And our Father, we have done what we can do. And we come now to open the doors of, of your church. You said in your word, and we claim the promise that you'd add on to the church daily such as should be saved. So visit now with that man, that woman, that boy, that girl, whoever needs to make a commitment to you today, give them neither rest nor tranquility until they all in surrender daily. And now while your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. The whole church is praying. Only God
and myself are looking. I want to extend to you today God's invitation. If you're a backslider, you need to come home. It's time to wake up and to get up. You're already a Christian, but you feel that God is leading you to join this band of Christian commandment-keeping pilgrims. Or maybe you're outside of the ark of safety and you want to accept Christ today as your personal savior from sin. Join the church and be baptized. Or maybe there's some other kind of a commitment that you feel that God is leading you to make the day. If you're here and you'd like to join Jesus, you can join on the profession of your faith. You can join by your Christian experience. You can join as a candidate for baptism. You can join by letter transfer of your membership. If you're here today and you'd like to join Jesus, I invite you now to wake up and then get up out of that pew. Press to the aisle that is closest to you and come forward and give us your hand and give God your heart. Are you here today? You know who you are. You know where you are. Will you do it in the name of Jesus? Don't let Satan rob you. Don't let him cheat you out of salvation. If you feel that urge to do it, that prompting to do it, that's the Holy Spirit of God speaking to you. Don't turn the Spirit off. Don't turn the Spirit back. Don't turn the Spirit away. If you'll take one feeble step towards Him, He'll take a thousand giant steps towards you. But He wants you to take that first step. Are you here? Will you do it? I beg you in the name of Jesus. The Bible says that now, right now, is the acceptable time. Behold, today, this day is the day of salvation. Yesterday is in the tomb. Tomorrow is in the womb. Today is all that you have. And only God knows if you got the balance of this day. And that's why you need to do it today. Are you here? Time after time, he's called you before. And now he's calling again to see if you open the door of your heart. Why? Oh, why? Won't you let him come in? You know who you are. You know where you are. You know that if Jesus should come at 6 o'clock today or claim your life, he will find you unprepared and ashamed in his presence. And today, you are challenged and confronted by the claims of the gospel. And God is calling you to wake up and to get up. How about it? Will you do it? I beg you, in the name of Jesus.
Teu lugar é o Heavenly Father. Sai. Seal. And deliver this message. To the hearts. Of your people. This day. We pray. In Jesus name. And let all the people see.